Hi guys, this is Marvin from ShopSadaPage.com and today we are going to do an unboxing and review of the Jik Jiki 64 mechanical keyboard from Banggood.com. Now this keyboard has a swappable mechanical switches but unlike the Jik Jiki 61, it uses the standard switch. It also has 64 keys which includes dedicated arrow keys while still maintaining its 60% size. We're going to talk about everything that you need to know about this keyboard as well as some key differences between this and the Jik Jiki 61. So let's get into it. The packaging for the Jik Jik 64 is pretty simple as you can tell. Inside the box, we have the keyboard itself wrapped with plastic, a user manual in both English and Chinese, a braided USB Type-C cable with gold-plated connectors, and a standard plastic keycap puller. Now, let's take a look at the Jik Jik 64 mechanical keyboard. At first touch, this keyboard feels really nice for its price. The design is good and it's pretty lightweight but it doesn't flex that much. It weighs around 442 grams which is the lightest keyboard that I've tried so far. The layout is non-standard but that's because it's squeezed in the dedicated arrow keys here which I really appreciate. We have a smaller right shift and a dedicated delete key. The right control and function keys are also smaller and the left shift key is also smaller than usual. All these adjustments were made to accommodate the dedicated arrow keys. At the back we have 4 rubber feet here and the technical information at the center. On its side, although there's no adjustable stand, the housing itself is slanted for that ergonomic design. It has a chamfered glossy design at the bottom and a high-profile case design to hide the switches for an overall clean look. This keyboard also used the standard OEM profile for the keycaps. At the back side of the keyboard, we have the USB Type-C port and a better view of the glossy black finish of the bottom part of this keyboard which is pretty identical to the Jik GK61. And lastly, here's a look at the front side. Overall, the design of this keyboard is quite decent and I also like the fact that the keycaps are matte black finish instead of the glossy finish of the Jik GK61. The only downside of this layout is it's not standard so it is more difficult to get compatible custom keycaps, although I've seen some that are specifically made for this layout. Now moving on, let's check out some key differences between the Jik GK61 and the Jik GK64. As you can see, they both have the same 60% form factor and probably the same bottom housing. But the Jik GK64 has dedicated arrow keys here, and like I said earlier, for that to be accommodated, the right control and function key is smaller than the regular keys on the Jik GK61. We also lose the menu and alt key on the Jik GK64, but we get a dedicated delete key here. As you can see, the Jik GK61 has the standard shift while the Jik GK64 has a smaller one on both sides. Other than that, all other keys are the same. Personally, I would prefer the layout of the Jik GK64 just for the sake of having a dedicated arrow keys. In terms of the legends and layers, since this is a 60% keyboard, you lose some of the valuable keys like the function rows up top as well as dedicated nav cluster which are all located on a different layer here. These layers can be toggled by simply pressing Fn plus the corresponding key. In terms of the other legends, we have the keys for adjusting lighting effects here and then we have the tab that doubles as a mode switch key the Windows lock key here, and the legends for the different profiles that you can use which we're going to discuss more later. Now in terms of the fonts used, this keyboard uses a very clean looking fonts as you can see here. It is a far cry from the usual gamery fonts that we typically see on budget keyboards. It is still of course subject to personal preference but I personally like this typeface. The keycaps are also very different from the glossy keycaps of the Jik GK61 which is a welcoming sign of relief. However, the keycaps are not that good and I will show you why later. Alright guys, let me just plug in this keyboard and turn off some lights here so that we can check the lighting effects. Okay, so with regards to the lighting modes, you can press Fn plus backspace to turn the illumination on and off. And to adjust the brightness, you simply press Fn plus P and Fn plus open bracket up until the LED blinks indicating that it is the maximum setting. You can also press Fn plus semicolon and Fn plus apostrophe to adjust the animation speed. Now for the lighting modes, we have two separate groups. One is the logic lights with the following basic animations. And then the other group is called code lights with the following reactive animations. This includes the audio visualizer that take advantage of the built-in microphone under the space bar like what the Jik GK61 has. Aside from that, you also have the basic functions like Fn plus Windows key to prevent start menu from popping. And that's pretty much it with the lighting effects. 
As usual, let's check out the LEDs on this keyboard real quick as we always do with our reviews. The LEDs on the Jik GK64 are SMD LEDs or surface mounted LEDs which features true RGB lighting or the ability to produce colors up to 16.8 million. With that, the transition of the colors is pretty smooth as you can see here, even the ones outside the primary colors. Now, since this keyboard is hot swappable, make sure that the switches you are going to use or replace this with are compatible with this type of LED implementation or in short, transparent key switches like what we have here. Now, before we move on, here's how bright the LEDs are when all the lights on this room are turned off. What I like about this keyboard is that it is a hot swappable board, which means you can easily swap out switches whenever you like. For example, if you want to try different switch or if ever some switch becomes faulty at some point. This means as long as the board itself is intact, you will be able to use this keyboard for a very long time. The Jik GK64 uses standard mechanical switches so it does have pins on it. And these pins are actually pretty fragile so make sure to slot it back in as careful as possible. Now let's discuss some key differences of the Jik GK64 and the Jik GK61 in terms of the switches. Both boards are hot swappable but accommodate different types of switch. The Jik GK64 uses standard switch while the GK61 uses an optical switch. As you can see the GK64 has slots for the pins of the switches while the GK61 has an IR and photoresistor sensor for the optical switch. Both boards have SMD LEDs or surface mounted LEDs for the illumination. Now looking closer on the switches, this is the optical Gateron switch and this one is a standard Gateron switch. They look pretty much the same except for the bottom part. The optical switch doesn't have pins like the standard switch which has a couple of pins right here. So if you're planning to grab a hot swappable keyboard, make sure you choose the right one for your preferred type of switch. If you want to learn more about optical switch, click here and watch my review of the Jik GK61. Now let's turn our focus on the switches on the Jik GK64. Like I said, it uses standard Gateron switch and what we have here is the blue version which is clicky and tactile. As with any other Gateron switch, this one is very smooth and satisfying to type with. Gateron blue switch requires the same 55 grams of actuation force as the original Cherry MX Blue. I've already discussed the differences between Gateron Blue, Cherry MX Blue, and RK Blue on my review of the Royal Clutch RK71 which you can check out here. Now in terms of the keycaps, although the fonts used is pretty good, the keycap itself is not so much. It is UV coated ABS plastic with laser edge fonts but unfortunately it is not double shot and super thin at around 1mm. In comparison, the keycap on the Jik GK61 is double shot with a thickness of around 1.4mm which is way better than the ones on the GK64. With regards to the stabilizers, it is quite decent without much annoying rattling sound and it also comes with some factory lube which is always a good sign. The board itself is from gkdingshi.com. I checked them out and there are actually a lot of interesting info there including different brands that they are supporting. Alright guys, as usual, let's do some typing tests so that you can have an idea how the Gutterm Blue sounds. Now finally, let's discuss the overall performance of the Jik GK64. As with most keyboards, the Jik GK64 also has NKRO or NKEY rollover feature that allows you to press as many keys as you want at the same time without conflicts. And as per my testing, it works flawlessly here as you can see, I am pressing up to 10 keys and they are all being registered. Now in terms of the typing experience, this being a keyboard with blue switch, it is one of the strong points especially for typists that likes clicky and tactile feedback. I personally don't like loud and clicky switches but the Gutterm Blues are undeniably satisfying to type with especially with its smooth travel. The 55 grams of actuation force is also at just the right amount for me for typing comfortably for a prolonged period of time. Now when it comes to gaming as I've mentioned in my previous reviews, most gamers prefer linear switches rather than the clicky ones as they are going to bottom out the keys anyways and the click and tactile feedback are really not necessary. But then again, it will still boil down to personal preference 
and there's really no definite answer for what Switch is good for gaming. With that being said, just to give you an idea if you're new to this, generally speaking, linear Switch is good for gaming as it's also silent and doesn't take away from the in-game sounds, while click and tactile Switch is good for typing so that you feel every key press and give you an idea that a particular letter has been activated. Some users, including myself, prefer the middle ground which is the brown switch that only has the tactile feedback. Alright guys, before we finish this review, let's discuss the software. This uses pretty much the same software as the Geek GK61. But now I have a better understanding of how to fully take advantage of this to enhance your workflow especially with the 60% form factor. It's still not very intuitive but it's actually quite powerful if you give it time to learn things around here. So basically, we have two main settings, the driver mode and the onboard settings that you can toggle using F and plus Q. The onboard settings are the one you should customize if you want to use this keyboard without the software. Like for example, if you frequently move between workstations or if you bring this keyboard along with you elsewhere. All the settings will be saved on the onboard memory of the keyboard. The driver mode on the other hand has the most customization options available for you since it's going to be supported by the software. You can pretty much do anything you want, you can change any key to a different function like other keys, numpad, media keys, mouse functions, system and networking, and you can also opt to disable some keys. To change a keys function, just simply press the key, choose the new key that you want, click apply and it will now function as the key you just entered. We also have the lighting tab here, which gives you a ton of lighting modes more than what you already have with the onboard settings. Including some special lighting modes here like the music volume, which will allow you to sync the lighting effects depending on the music you are playing. This is different by the way to the audio visualizer using the built-in microphone. That one will pick up all sounds including background noise and everything you do around the keyboard. Aside from the presets, you can also opt to make your own custom lighting here using the do-it-yourself static light option. Now, aside from the functions and lighting modes, we also have the macro list here, and you can also set up lighting effects per keys here. But most importantly, you also have the shortcut feature wherein you can pretty much launch anything like videos, programs, and other files just by pressing a single key. You can also record your own macros here, and once you're finished recording, it will show up on your macro list here which you can now set up on any key that you want. Now when it comes to the onboard settings, you still have a lot of customization options, but you will lose some of the cool ones, such as some lighting modes and the music sync mode, as well as the shortcut feature. What you have here instead are three available layers that you can take advantage for your workflow. You can toggle these layers by pressing F and plus W, E, and R. And lastly, we also have the layer switch feature, which I think is the most important tool that you need for this keyboard. Here's how it works. So the first layer is for the arrow keys as you can see here. And then the layer 2 is for the function keys using the numbers row. And then the layer 3 is the nav cluster here. For the nav cluster, you can easily toggle them since the function button is right below here. But the problem is with the function rows up top you're going to need two hands just to activate the function rows. What I did here is I used the caps lock button as the trigger for the layer 2. So instead of using the function key here, I can easily toggle the functions row by pressing caps lock momentarily to activate the functions keys. So now I just need one hand to activate keys like F2 for renaming things, as well as frequently used key combinations like Alt F4. And I always say that the layer implementation for me will make or break a 60% keyboard, that's why I really like the Unpro 2 because of its magic FN feature that works basically the same as the one I did here. The only problem here is that we lose the functionality of the caps lock, which is not a big deal for me since I don't use the caps lock key anyways. And that's pretty much it with regards to the software. I suggest you take your time to learn this if ever you decide to get this keyboard as it is quite useful. Speaking of deciding, let me give you my final thoughts. Well, I think the Geek GK64 is a really good contender for the best budget 60% mechanical keyboard, especially at its price point. It's no way an Unpro 2 killer since it lacks the wireless functionality and has significantly lower quality materials, but for what it's worth, it also has a lot of advantage that it brings into the table. It features hot swappable board that accommodates standard switch and arguably a better layout than the Geek GK61 with its dedicated arrow keys. This is good for those who are looking to step down in size without compromising the efficiency of their workflow. It also has a very powerful, albeit an intuitive software that you can take advantage to completely customize the keyboard to your own personal preference. Overall, as with most budget keyboards, it is not perfect, but it's definitely worth checking out. And there you have it guys, thank you for watching. Make sure to check the full article linked below. Huge thanks to Bangu.com for sending this in and for their continued support on my channel. You can get this from their official store link below as well as the promo code that you can use for additional 10% off your purchase. 
Subscribe if you like this and see you next time. Thank you. Have a great day.